The most important tool available to a technician or an engineer is probably the oscilloscope. The oscilloscope's job is to present an image of a waveform over a period of time. In this case, we have a, a sine wave showing, but it can also show you a square wave, a sawtooth wave, and a pulse. Today I'm going to be talking about oscilloscopes, all uh, two-channel units. You can see there are five different units here. Uh, the upper two are digital oscilloscopes. Uh, they have uh, liquid crystal displays. And the newest one of the, of the lot, the O1 above, which is also the most probably the cheapest of the units, uh, has a, a color display so you can identify which channel is which. Uh, all of the units have a 100 megahertz bandwidth, with the exception of the Tektronix TDS-1002, which is shown right here. It has a, uh, a 60 megahertz bandwidth, but it also has the uh, most capable measurement functions, probably, of the three units. You would think the O1, being the, being the newer unit, would be would have that, but it's just not quite as well uh, engineered as a, as a Tektronix device is. What we will be talking about in this set of videos is the commonality that all scopes have with one another. And you can see that, and this is very true of the, tech, uh, of the uh, Tektronix scopes on the bottom left and the UW Instech scopes is that they, they all have a very similar layout. And even the digital oscilloscopes on the top have very similar layouts. The, the one exception being the, uh, the display block that uh, is, is absent in those. It's strictly menu driven in the, in the upper two scopes. So what I'm gonna talk about is how to set up an oscilloscope. And I'm gonna concentrate initially on the GW Instech uh, if you can learn to use this one, you can probably learn to use anything because it does have some rather peculiar uh, requirements for, for setting up uh, some of the measurements. And I'll talk about the uh, Tektronix TDS1002 a little bit uh, after that and how to run the, uh, a menu-driven system. So uh, get ready. All oscilloscopes, despite uh, variations in you know, how they acquire signal, whether it's digitally or whether it's in an analog format, will function the same way and have generally the same control blocks. All oscilloscopes have, uh, as a minimum, three control blocks, usually on the front of the scope, and then they'll have you know uh, one or two hidden blocks. We can look at uh, all, all scopes as have universally having a, a volts division or a vertical control block. All, oscill all oscilloscopes will have that. And you can see that on, on these two uh, oscilloscopes, both of them being two channel units, that there is a vertical control block or a volts division block here, and it's laid out almost in an identical fashion as far as positionally uh, with this unit they'll have a horizontal block, which is the time control block. And they're pretty much laid out identically there. The last block tends to be the trigger block, which determines when the signal is going to be uh, read by the scope and then how it's displayed. And you can see the lift goes here. The difference in the two scopes becomes uh, apparent when we start looking at the uh, display or the power control block. The GDS unit below, the 6103, has a dedicated little block that is for turning on the power and adjusting the display, the illumination, the focus, the intensity of either the trace or the readout, and also adjusting the, uh, the trace rotation. The Tektronix TDS-1002 will not have a trace rotation adjustment because uh, unlike 
the, the unit here, the there is no electron beam that has to fire from the back of the unit and hit the phosphors on the front to uh, create a trace. The electron beam is deflected by some magnets. In the presence of a strong magnetic field, those this trace can actually become distorted and cause a, a, a uh, well, it'll look, uh, the, the trace will run sideways or, 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 or some, uh, some odd fashion. And what you'll need to do is readjust it to where it's level. And that's what the trace rotation knob is for. Because there is no electron beam in the upper unit, you don't have to worry about things like that. The upper unit, it's, uh, it doesn't per se have a display block, but it has a display button in which you can change how you want to view the line that's on the CRT, whether you want it as vectors, which is a little bit smoother than the other option, which is dots, obviously. And you have some other persistence and format, and we'll discuss those a little bit later. And then increasing and decreasing the contrast. The easiest block to understand on an oscilloscope is the uh, display block and the power block. And on the VW Instec, they're absolutely indicative of what they do. The illuminate button does just that. It, it places a, uh, a lighted background onto the, uh, onto the display. The focus button will focus the trace. And of course, you always want that as as well focused as you possibly can to get the thinnest trace. You have an intensity for the trace and you can also do a trace for the readout. I recommend that if you are using a analog scope, one that has a cathode ray tube as, as this one does, that you adjust the display for the minimum brightness needed for you to view it. One of the things that can happen to a, a CRT is something called trace burn-in. If this trace and this set of images, the channel one equals five volts DC, etc., were left on for a period of time, the, the phosphors would actually display those values in that trace continuously, uh, which would obviously limit the effectiveness of the, of the unit. The only section that I haven't talked about so far is this little thing called the trace rotation and also the, uh, the, this calibration port. That calibration port I'm gonna discuss when I get into actually using a, a, a oscilloscope probe. Right now, all I've got hooked up is a, is a BNC cable for some, uh, for some demonstration purposes. One of the things that can happen to a analog scope is this trace or the or even these uh, readouts can become uh, they're no longer horizontal. They actually be, will begin to ha have somewhat of a, of a drift angle to them. And this is because the beam which is fired from the from the cathode ray tube onto the onto the readout or, or onto the uh, the display is uh, is fire is controlled by some magnetic fields. Uh, I have a, a strong magnet that I'm going to place next to the unit, and you can see how how much it is uh, is affecting the rotation of that trace. And when I remove the magnetic field, there's still this isn't too bad, but there's still a slight rotation to that to that trace. So using a, uh, preferably a, a non-metallic tool, uh, go in and adjust the trace as, you, as needed. And that looks, that looks pretty good right there. Uh, to show you how it's more important on the old analog types than it is on the the more modern digital scopes. I have a digital scope set up here. Uh, very same 
set up values. And again, I'm putting the magnet right next to the body of the unit. And you can see it has, has very little effect at all on it. I'd like to talk about the vertical block on the analog scope first. And um, I'll just go straight down the, uh, the list of the controls. You can see here there's a cursor control. This is really technically not a part of this block, but uh, by pressing it. On the Instec, uh, if you, anything that you see that has an underline on it means that you press and hold the button for uh, two or three seconds to activate that function. I'm going to leave those off for right now. Uh, the next button is uh, position, and you can see I've got a, uh, a sine wave on the display. It's approximately two volts, and with the position knob, I can take that and move it up and down to, uh, to a good reference point, to a measuring point. And in this case, I'm going to take the trace and just have it kiss uh, this line right here and if I wanted to measure this I could just go straight up and then kind of guesstimate uh, how far above the center line or above this line uh, the top of that trace is but uh, it'd be better and I'm kind of jumping ahead here to take the, uh, the horizontal position knob and move that over until it is on the center graticule and what I'll want to do is count up from where I set my the base of my display. So one, two, three, four. And it's approximately 4.1 divisions. I say 4.1 because um, you're allowed some interpolation on, on the on scopes. Uh, each one of these divisions right now is worth that half a volt value. So at four divisions at half a volt, we're looking at about two volts. Each one of these subdivisions is worth 0.2 of whatever this scale is. So if we look at uh, this, it, since I use the bottom of the line here to begin my measurement, the bottom of the trace, I want to use the bottom of the trace up here to end the measurement. So if I'm looking at this, I would say 4.1 divisions, and I would multiply that by the 0.5, so I would come out to approximately uh, 2.1 volts peak to peak. And I'll go ahead and center this back up again to its more or less original position. And use that right there. Okay. Um, there's a bandwidth limit switch. Pressing that, currently, uh, if, if, if you can see up here, uh, you can see that this is a 100 megahertz oscilloscope. That means that it should produce uh, any, reproduce any signal input into it with, some, with uh, fidelity up to 100 megahertz. Now, this is, there's some caveats to that, and uh, we're going to have to get into those a little bit later. Uh, bandwidth does decrease uh, given certain factors, uh, certain inputs. But if you hit that button, that 20 megahertz button, instead of this being a 100 megahertz scope, it's now a 60, or I'm sorry, a, a 20 megahertz scope. And this is useful if you're uh, testing things like uh, switching power supplies, which typically have a uh, uh, a specification on their data sheets for uh, ripple and noise uh, up to usually 20 megahertz. The, uh, the cursor function is activated when you press and hold that button up there, which uh, again, I, as I mentioned, was uh, we're not going to discuss that. You have a volts division knob. It's t it's, uh, what it does is it changes the sensitivity of the oscilloscope. Uh, as you turn it counterclockwise, it'll go down to two millivolts uh, for its lowest voltage reading, and it'll go up all the way to five volts per division for its highest. This is on a, on a times one function. Uh, most scopes have uh, the 
the values, the voltage values in a one, two, five scale. So right now I'm on a five scale. The next value up should be uh, one volt, and then I should go two volt, and then I should go five volt. So typically it's a one, two, five scale, and you can see that that's true for this one as well. Uh, the variable button will take the scope out of calibration. It's very useful if you want to do rise time measurements, and that's a press and hold function uh, from the underlying indication. And channel one will actually turn channel one on and off. And since we're hooked up to it right now, we don't really want to turn that one off. Um, right below that is the, the ground button, and it does a double duty as a probe times 10 switch. When, you're, when you hit that ground button, what you are doing is you're disconnecting the signal that's coming in on your, your, your connector from the internal amplifiers in the oscilloscope. You are not grounding the signal. You never want to ground the, uh, the signal that you're measuring. It's obviously, it's a short circuit. So you, you want to avoid that at all costs. If I pressed and hold, held this button, I would get a probe times 10 indication. Since again, I'm using BNC, I want us to keep it on times one. So returning that signal and coming down to the next function, you'll see an AC DC button. Currently, we are in AC. So we are measuring 0.5 volts of AC. And what that means is that this scope currently is only looking at an AC component uh, that might be coming into the connector. If I were to uh, hit the DC button, now the scope would look at the AC, uh, look at any input coming in here for a DC as well. Uh, and as you probably remember that AC uh, algebraically adds itself to any DC voltage, so it looks at it almost like it's a ground uh, level. Uh, I do have two volts of DC set into this, and I'm gonna move my trace down. Uh, I'll, in fact, I'll go ahead and ground it, and I'll know that um, this is zero volts. And as a matter of fact, uh, going back to, the, to something we discussed previously, you can see this trace is just a little bit uh, rotated. So I'm going to go ahead and adjust this with the trace rotation while I'm at it. And that looks very good right there. So I'm going to put the, uh, take the ground signal, take the ground out, and you'll see that again I have my two volts peak to peak signal. But now I'm going to hit the DC button and I'm going to add a, D, uh, a two volt offset. Well, how do I know this is two volts? Having set the ground here, so this is my ground point, and then input my signal once again, what I can do is take the bottom of, the, of this trace and set it to the bottom of the bottom graticule or the bottom line and then knowing that this is as low, the lowest negative peak that I have if I place this back on you'll notice that it's jumped up from this point to one two three four so just slightly over four divisions at 0 0.4 0 0.5 volts and again we're looking at a two volt a little over two volt DC offset so you do have the capability to, to measure both of those. This is extremely handy when you're dealing with amplifiers that, uh, well, transistor amplifiers as an example, that have a, a base voltage on them uh, for biasing, the DC base voltage, and that would have uh, some kind of a AC signal or a switching signal perhaps, or, well, not a switching signal in, in the case of a bias voltage. Um, if I were to decrease my AC voltage to 100 millivolts peak to peak you'll notice that uh, it's I've still got the offset value so I'm now I'm going to go, let's go ahead and ground my signal once again and set a ground reference point and there we go 
and you can see that the, the signal still jumped up the same two volts, but now you cannot see that, that very small or relatively small uh, AC component. If you wanted to look at that independently, now you have to go back into the DC function, move the scope display up, and then you can increase the sensitivity and make a measurement on the new value.